Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to TechGeek webinar series, our endeavor to empower techies. We believe that sharing of knowledge is the key to enhance our skills and grow us as professionals. With this principle in mind, we have initiated a series of webinars conducted by industry experts to give you all a crisp insight of various domains. The topic of today's session is the DNA of building, DNA of building software products fast track method. Our guest speaker today is Mr. Sharad Sharma. Chair NASCOM Product Forum. Sharad chairs the NASCOM Product Forum, is an active member, mentor for startups and has deep experience in product development, incubation, cloud computing infrastructure and applications. His personal mantra is to lead big and small companies through orbit change. In the past, he has led Yahoo India R&D as their CEO and was responsible, responsible for emerging markets engineering and several key global products. Mr. Sharma has about 23 plus years of experience in internet software and wireless sectors and was instrumental in managing a turnaround of Veritas India's Ops, a, a startup and an entrepreneurial setup of AT&T Lucent's R&D in India. So without further delay, I introduce you all to our guest speaker. Over to you, Mr. Sharath. Hey, thank you, Mohini. Uh, this is Sharad here. Thank you all for joining. Uh, you know, today I am actually speaking on behalf of a large number of uh, uh, people in the industry. Uh, many of us uh, have been <coughs> passionate about seeing product industry grow in India. Uh, and, and usually this passion has come from being involved in the industry in the past. As uh, Mohini said, I have uh, been involved in the product industry in the past. Uh, you know, one of the things she didn't mention that I had done a startup roughly about 10 years back, which is a part of Cisco, and I am, uh, you know, back uh, as an entrepreneur again, although I remain a very active uh, angel investor and uh, a champion of uh, of the product ecosystem. So today, you know, I, I could go very wide and I could have shared with you the broad landscape that exists in the product industry, but instead of doing that, I want to take an important slice of the industry and go a little deeper into that slice. Uh, and in the Q&A, if we have time, then we can uh, uh, talk about some other slices of the product industry as well. So today, uh, the slice that I want to talk about is really uh, to do with corporate applications. And the context for that is really this slide that you see in front of you. I'm on slide two right now. And uh, and in this slide, as you can see, every 15 years or so, there is a very big shift that takes place in our industry. You know, and we are in the midst of that shift. You know, all of you know about that. I'm not going to belabor that point. Uh, but, you know, this is a bigger shift than usual for multiple reasons. Uh, you know, one, of course, we have cloud coming in and wrapped inside this cloud transition is a very big data transition as well. Uh, so that's one reason. The second reason why this is bigger than usual is that in the life of every industry, you know, there is one time in that life of the industry where it becomes driven by consumer technology. And this is finally beginning to happen uh, in our IT industry. This happened, if you go back in time, this happened in the communications industry. You know, when Skype came about, uh, then voice over IP started becoming popular. So if you go back in time, uh, you know, and if Alexander Graham Bell was to arrive uh, back on Earth, <laughs> let's say early 90s, he would have recognized the telephone infrastructure that he left behind. But if he comes back today, he would not recognize the communications infrastructure that exists today. And that change, that did not happen in a big way in the first 50 years, but has happened in a big way in the last 25 years is largely because consumer tech or consumerization of, uh, of technology uh, hit the communications industry. Now we are in a similar change. You know, if, uh, we are beginning to see consumerization of applications and technology that is happening in a corporate environment. And so you can be sure that in the next 20, 30 years, things are going to change in a very significant way. So that's that's the stage that I want you to set here uh, in 
front of you uh, as, as we move forward. So with that uh, context in mind, uh, uh, you know, what can we be sure of? What, what is it that will change? You know, we of course can be sure of that cloud will be ubiquitous, uh, that uh, to this audience especially <clears throat> does not require any teaching at all. We can be also sure of that devices, you know, will proliferate in a very big way. And, uh, and you know, tablets, uh, you know, phones, smartphones will be ubiquitous. And they will bring a new consumption paradigm, therefore, into even in the workplace. I mean, it is already happening as an individual consumer, uh, uh, but it, the question that I want to lay in front of you in the remaining part of the presentation is really about the kind of changes that will happen in the corporate environment as well. And if you especially look at US, you would find, and I know this is really impossible to read at the bottom right of this slide, but you would find that uh, that lots of people are already, uh, you know, using multiple devices in the workplace, and uh, that's, uh, that's a number that is growing very rapidly. So with that, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about corporate apps. And, uh, you know, how is this world uh, going to evolve uh, over, the f over, the, over the future? So there are two points uh, <coughs> that I want to make here. The first point is really that the cost of development is coming down significantly, right? And, you know, what would have taken, <laughs> taken years to build uh, is now being built much, much sooner. And this is happening everywhere in the world. Uh, you know, even if you look at some very big applications here in India, uh, you know, one of the big projects uh, that one of the Indian SIs has done is uh, the ESIC project. And they use a rapid application kind of prototyping framework for making that happen. And as a result of it, you know, that they were able to build this out much sooner than would have been possible otherwise. I mention that only because <laughs> the development tools that they were using to make that happen were also built out in India. <laughs> so it's a very interesting example of a, of a uh, Indian startup providing the development tools and then a very big Indian SI uh, using those tools to build a big government application and uh, deploying all of that much, much faster than would have been the case. So so this is pervasive. This is, this is something you can begin to see in a very big way. Uh, we have a very interesting... Uh, side story around this, uh, uh, you know, this session is tied up uh, to some extent with the NASCOM product conclave that would take place on the 7th and 8th of November. And, uh, you know, and one of the sessions that we have uh, showcases uh, youngsters, people under 16 who have accomplished something in India. And one of the youngsters that you would see there is a 15-year-old, actually out of Delhi, and uh, who has 11 Android applications in his name, you know, and uh, more than 100,000 downloads, uh, you know, for those applications, has written a 356-page book published by Springer on uh, uh, on how to develop augmented reality applications for Android. So here is a situation where now 15-year-olds are writing books and applications in this new world. And why is this possible is simply because the cost of application development is coming down. It's both coming down on the time dimension, it is coming down on the team size dimension. And uh, and therefore, the costs are going to come down. And this is significant. Why is it significant? Because in the, in the corporate environment, and this is a very important point that I want to make for you, is that in the corporate environment, Today, there is a huge backlog of applications that are needed. And, uh, and you know, there is, as in any other part of the world, uh, there is elasticity, there's price elasticity. So if the applications, corporate applications, could be developed cheaper, then, you know, there will be more consumption of those applications. People will consume them in a much bigger way than has been the case in the past. And, and so therefore when you put both of these things together, what you get is an environment that we can predict in the future that there'll be corporate applications, you know, many more of these applications 
smaller footprint applications around, uh, you know, uh, everywhere in the world, in, in Western uh, companies and, of course, in uh, Indian companies as well. Now, you know, some people argue that this would only happen for supporting applications or for situational applications, you know, and this would not happen for core applications. You know, traditionally the core applications have been things like ERP and, uh, and, and you know, my own personal belief is that is not true at all. I gave you an example of ESIC, which was anything but a supporting or a situational application. It was a core application and yet it it was uh, it, it benefited dramatically benefited I would say uh, from uh, being able to be done quicker faster uh, and cheaper so this this tsunami of lower cost corporate applications is going to touch every type of applications uh, application that exists in the corporate environment and uh, and some of the existing corporate applications they will become much more platformized, and so you'll be able to build on top of those as well. And why is that important? And that is important largely because there is a new paradigm that is emerging. And in this new paradigm, <laughs> what is happening is that, that you are seeing modularization of an application happen because of everything being anchored to a common data model. And so let me give you an example of that. If you went back in time and uh, <clears throat> wanted to build a quote to cash application for the enterprise, you know, that would have taken you a year or more. Uh, it would have been an ERP-like kind of an implementation. It would have been called at that time an umbrella application because, you know, it would have been a big application, hundreds of people involved, uh, you know, spending a lot of time building it out. Today, you would accomplish the same thing by actually having lots of modular applications and each of those standalone applications, something to do with quotation, something to do with uh, CRM, something to do with accounts receivable, you know, collections and so on and so forth. And all of them, however, making sense, uh, weaving a common story from quote to cash. Why? Because they would all be interacting with a with a data model that is consistent across all of those applications. So, so this is a this is a reason why you are beginning to see a whole revolution that is taking place in this world of applications. And there is a flat world I like to call it that is emerging. And in this flat world, just the way you have an iPhone <coughs> store uh, where you can buy your consumer application you are gradually going to move to a paradigm where even corporate applications will be bought from these aggregated entities, where aggregation points where many of these applications would live. Now, it might sound to you that this idea that I'm talking about is somewhat outlandish. Uh, it is something that does not exist today and is not likely to exist in the near future you know, this may sound to some of you as something which is too far in the future. And that is anything but true. And, you know, and why I say that is because we have a number of companies already in India who have embraced this kind of a world in a big way. And some of these companies are well known. And, uh, you know, I'm going to talk about that uh, uh, later uh, in the presentation as well. Uh, but take Fusion Charts and it's as an example, right? And uh, that's a classic example of a company that is very, very niche focused uh, and sells mostly to corporates, right? Most of their paying customers are are corporates, and um, and they have a very large presence, uh, very large customer base uh, in the Western markets, right? Uh, and guess. You know, where did they build the company? They built it in Kolkata. Uh, so, so, so the point that I'm making is that it is truly a flat world. In, an, in this flat world, it doesn't matter where your application comes from. It could come from Kolkata. It co could come from Bangalore. It could come from California. It doesn't really matter because in this world, what really matters is 
do you have a great application or not? And if you do, then you have the power to be able to take your application and get it in the hands of corporate users worldwide. So this is the change. Uh, this is the opportunity uh, that is there in front of us. Now I must caution and say, look, what am I talking about? I am by and large talking about SaaS type of applications. Uh, I am talking about applications that are hosted somewhere, so you don't have a big deployment infrastructure that you have to worry about inside the corporate environment. Uh, they could be deployed in some cases inside a private cloud within the corporate environment, but either way, you know, they're cloud-based applications. Uh, they are quickly deployed. The payment models for this are relatively simple, you know, uh, in some form of pay-per-use uh, kind of a model uh, kind of exists there. So if that is a that is a opportunity in front of us, right? Uh, and if the opportunity in front of us is for literally hundreds and thousands of SaaS applications that will be built, they'll be put up on the internet, you know, they'll be sold without uh, on the ground sales force. They'll be sold remotely through the web, uh, you know, not to consumers, but as I said, to corporate environments, to businesses, to small, medium, large businesses. If that is the opportunity that we are chasing, then the question is, what is the fast track method of building such companies out or building such applications out, right? And here I would like to <clears throat> share with you four uh, uh, segments or so four ideas and uh, spend a little time uh, kind of going through uh, all the four. So the first and foremost is, uh, you know, how do you, uh, how do you find and contact the market? And, and the important point here is, for, I, I purposely leave it a little vague, but, but really for $10 uh, 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 ideas, right? And uh, these could be $10 a user a year, <laughs> and there are uh, applications like that. You know, you have uh, uh, some Indian companies like Important, for example, in Bombay, is uh, <clears throat> disrupting the HRIS market by offering full-fledged application, you know, which is probably more in the range of, you know, seven, eight dollars a user a year, right? And uh, and think of it, you know, that's a very, very aggressive price point. And and once you start selling at that price point in India, you know, you can play a whole disruptive role uh, in other markets as well. So we'll come back and talk about this idea a little bit more. Second is that once you can you can identify an opportunity like this, you know, can you quickly turn it into a sellable idea? And that requires uh, a way to really develop your idea in a way uh, that engages prospective customers right from the beginning. So, you know, I call that extracting the idea. It's not my term and I'm going to spend a little more time sharing with you where it comes from and where you can go and read more about it in a few minutes. So, you know, stay with me. Uh, we'll come back and talk about this. And then, of course, is the building, the SaaS solution. And this is one topic I spend least time on because, you know, here in India, we're very good at building the software. You know, we're good techies, uh, <clears throat> but we are not so good in the other aspects, uh, which is product management and, and selling aspects. And so I focus more on the last point then, which is you know, once you do get your SaaS solution uh, in place, then how do you get it out in the market and, and, and kind of uh, make it successful. So let's spend a little time <coughs> talking about all these ideas. So why $10 ideas? You know, first of all, what's this about $10 ideas that I'm talking about? Now, before I answer that question and I give you an example, I want to tell you about a major shift that is taking place in the corporate environment. And the shift is that corporate applications are no longer being bought only by CIOs. And in fact, I ask, I pose this question, you know, who is making these buying decisions to Piercing? You know, you see his bio up there. He's a well-regarded uh, CIO. Uh, in the US uh, and I posed this question to him and 
you know, he pointed me to this iPad app page. And he said, look, I'm in the insurance business. Today, if I go there and look for corporate insurance applications, so these are not consumer insurance applications, I find 443 applications out there, right? And he said, you know what, this is a trick question. I wonder how many of them were three years, are there three years ago. Now, if you know, you know, you can remember iPad was launched only in the May time frame uh, of 2010. So wasn't there, strictly speaking, <laughs> three years ago, right? So, so you are at a point where in two and a half years, suddenly you have a situation where number of insurance applications, just the way I talk to you, they're not umbrella applications, they are modular applications that solve the code to cash kind of a problem that would have been earlier solved by one application is now being solved by a clutch of applications. You know, that environment exists today. That has come about and that is taking, that is, that is out there even today. And so if when you have these kind of applications, who are buying them? Now these are the people who are buying them. These are people who are not in the IT department. They are part of the line of business. They are functional heads or, or running their own business units. And uh, an example of that, you should just take marketing as an example, the fastest growing role within marketing is a role called the marketing technologist. And the marketing technologist who dotted line reports into the CIO's organization, but solid line reports into the CMO organization, is the one making decisions about what marketing applications and technologies to buy. And in their view of the world, you know, on, in the picture that you see on the bottom left, you know, they see themselves as being about speed, about agility, about making a marketing impact, uh, you know, and bringing differentiated applications to the workplace. So, so these are the people that are, there are new types of buyers that have emerged. These are very unconventional buyers. So if we have spent our last 10, 15 years, you know, trying to sell into the CIO environment, just keep in mind, you know, that world is changing, changing very, very quickly. And that's an opportunity. That's a <laughs> wonderful opportunity for new players to come in and take advantage of. And indeed, that is what is happening. So, <clears throat> so this is a good place to talk about the $10 story again. Because if you go back in time, and not too long ago, you know, you would have bought a CRM solution at $200 a seat, effectively $200 a seat. And if you are IBM, you know, which has literally a 100-year history of selling, right, where each sales executive carries a multi-million dollar target, you could say $200 a month per salesperson is not bad. I mean, I, I can afford to spend $2,400 on my salesperson who probably carries at a minimum of $4 million target. And you know, when I do that, I get a custom CRM application for my, for my team, which, has, which is able to take advantage of my long history of good practices around selling. <laughs> so it makes a lot of sense. There is a market effort for Siebel type implementations. Uh, and uh, you know, that market actually is still around, it continues to grow. But then Salesforce came around and they said, you know what, <clears throat> I give you something which is somewhat similar for $60 a seat. And you know the story, Salesforce has done very well in that area. And they competed with Siebel at the edges, but what they did was open up a whole new market underneath Siebel because they were able to take their solution to people who could not even conceive of affording that $200 solution but could definitely think of buying the $60 solution. And what is our Chennai-based company done? Our Chennai-based company went out and said, you know what, I have another CRM solution, <laughs> and that is actually meant for smaller businesses. You know, those businesses who cannot even afford $60. I have something that I've thought through, built from ground up, and that's a solution that I'll offer to you at $12 a seat, right? And you know what, you know about Zoho, I'm sure, you know they're doing very well. They have a lock-in in this part of the market, the $10, $12 per seat market. So this phenomenon of opening up of this bottom tier is what we are talking about. This is happening even inside big companies. That is the big point that I want to make for you. It is, of course, opening up opportunities to sell 
these kind of applications, ten dollar applications uh, to smaller businesses, to the SMEs worldwide. That opportunity is a very big opportunity by itself. But layered on top of that is another opportunity where you can actually go out and sell these ten dollar uh, uh, seat applications, even inside big companies, big enterprises. And that is something which is very important. So the question then is, how do you find out about these opportunities? How do you how do you put your hands around the ideas that that could be commercialized? And and that is where I would say <laughs> this whole thinking about lean startups, about customer discovery, uh, you know, have become very important. And the backstory there, of course, is that in the last five years, you know, there is so much new learning that has taken place about how to handle the early stages of the company much better. The iterative portion where you are learning, engaging with the market, not necessarily with the product yet built out, very often with the product not yet built out, right? Where it is an idea in your head and that is something that you are trying out. And, and that idea has taken root in a very big way. And as it has taken root, uh, you know, more discipline has emerged in, in making it happen. And so these are some of the questions, for example, uh, you know, you could start asking people to be able to extract that idea that you could commercialize. Now, I could talk a lot about this, but I think the beauty of this whole uh, new wave of sharing that is there is that you can actually go to the source and learn about it. And I would strongly encourage you uh, to check out uh, Dane's uh, uh, videos where he talks about uh, idea extraction. And what is more, he doesn't, doesn't talk about it. He lets you over here <laughs> watch the process at work where people have done idea extraction and have successfully turned them into businesses. And you have the privilege of being able to listen in on that process and see how they had done it. So this is something, you know, which is, which is very, very amazing and interesting. This is something we here in India need to focus more on because before we build, you know, is this exercise that needs to happen. And only once we have wrapped our hands around the problem, uh, we've had wrapped our around around the pain, you know, the way we are going to resolve that pain and, uh, and validated that this is a sellable pro pro proposition, then only we should go out and build it out, right? Building it before all of that is done is uh, is no longer considered to be the right way to proceed forward. <laughs> and again, you know, this has been happening. I mean, it is not that it's not been happening. We have our own success stories where people have somehow stumbled into this. Uh, you know, there is this success story about apartment adda where Venkat, you know, stumbled into this idea because he happened to buy an apartment, discovered that his building society, the new apartment society, didn't have a good solution. You know, he hacked it together. Uh, and now, of course, has managed to turn it into a very viable business. Uh, you know, this happened with Great uh, as well. You know, where again, they're not selling a ten dollar uh, business, but they're selling a, literally a ten rupee business. You know, where they're doing payroll processing for you for ten rupees uh, per employee per month, right? So, so again, people have stumbled into this. What is different now is that this whole process is becoming a science. So instead of stumbling around, taking a lot of time to you know, discover that idea, <laughs> you can accelerate the whole process if you embrace a disciplined approach to making it happen. And and uh, and I would strongly encourage you to do that. As I said, you know I'm not going to talk a lot about about building the SaaS solution, so which is why you would notice some of you would notice that. I don't even have that bullet highlighted. I'm not talking about that because that's an area which many of you understand very, very well, and uh, and that's not where the pain is there in the system. So instead, I want to talk to you a little bit about selling the SaaS solution. Right now, selling the SaaS solution is really all about doing it on the net. So if you want to do it on the net, obviously the first place you start is with your landing page, right? And I show you an example here uh, of a landing page uh, of, a, of an Indian company 
uh, <clears throat> Orange Cape out of Chennai again. Uh, and I don't know why I have only Chennai examples today. This is the second one, Zoho and Orange Cape that I mentioned. But, uh, 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 but they recently launched a product uh, <clears throat> on the web called Kisslow. So if you go to Kisslow's page, this is what you will see. It's a relatively simple page. It'll, you will see that you know you can start you can take it for a walk and try it out you know by by signing up for it for free right there isn't any charge for doing that and of course once you start using it they'll encourage you to upgrade to a premium version so then you can launch it right once your landing page is ready then of course uh, you have to do a launch in this case and not everybody manages to do this but in this case uh, they they were the only non-Google product that was launched at Google I.O. Uh, in late June 2012, right? You know, as, as you may remember, Google launched a lot of uh, stuff at Google I.O. this year. So the only non-Google company <clears throat> that got a slot to launch something there, formally launch something there, is uh, not a California-based company, not a Boston-based company, <laughs> but an Indian company based out of India, you know, which yet doesn't have an office, you know, its own office in the US. So they launched it there, and then of course, they did a lot of work to drive traffic, uh, to encourage people to try this application out. And today, uh, we are talking about October, uh, June to October, they are already the number one application in their category on the Google Apps Marketplace. So just think of it, right? And uh, uh, so it is possible. And uh, an Indian companies are doing it today. So my, my fundamental point that I would like to make to you here is that, is that there is a new paradigm that is emerging. And this new paradigm that is emerging is really about uh, finding small application ideas that would work in the enterprise environment. <clears throat> Not the consumer environment alone. I know that's a very big opportunity by itself. We can talk about it another day. But in the enterprise environment, I want you, you know, in this talk to focus a little bit on the enterprise environment. And, and there are lots of such ideas that you can, with discipline, extract them, build them, and sell them in the global marketplace. And as an Indian company, you can do it as successfully as, as if you were based anywhere else in the world. So this is the mega opportunity that is in front of us. Now these kind of opportunities, these kind of issues, is what we will be talking about at the NASCOM product conference. And I want to, <clears throat> this is not a commercial for the NASCOM product conference. But you know what, we don't need a commercial. The reason we don't need a commercial here is because product conflict itself is a product of, it's a, it's a creation of, of volunteers who are already involved in the industry. You know, uh, these are people like you and me who are really interested, motivated in seeing the Indian product industry come about. And this is the fourth year we are doing it in this model, who then decided for themselves that, that uh, who decided for themselves that uh, that uh, you know we got to do something <laughs> with, by by using a Wikipedia type of a model by spending a little time uh, <clears throat> on doing something for the industry. You know we can construct uh, platforms and we can construct uh, <clears throat> uh, events like the product conclave. You know which can be world class in nature. So this is what has happened. Very often people do it for uh, the sessions that are curated, are curated by people uh, for themselves. You know, I see one session up here which is called content marketing, you know, which I see on the top left here. And, and uh, by the way, the content marketing session manager is Amit Ranjan, who as many of you may know, is the co-founder of SlideShare, right? Now, he's the he's a CEO of the session manager uh, uh, for the content marketing session. And so what is, why is he doing that? Because he is doing that, this allows him to become clear up his thoughts about how to do world-class content marketing, 
how to then present a session that everybody can benefit from. And since we are doing it all collectively, it allows us to bring people together that would otherwise not have been possible. Right? So in, for this particular session, for example, we have the Kolavari guys who are going to come in and talk about their experience of making that particular song uh, successful, which is you know, a form of content marketing. Uh, if you look at, if I pick another uh, uh, session here, which is just below it, which is about uh, automating SMBs. <laughs> you know, it is about making the Indian SMB market open. That's again done by a group of people, entrepreneurs, in this particular case by George Beta. He's a session manager. Now, he's been in this business for quite some time. And so he's put together a session along with others, you know, <laughs> which is a session that he would himself like to attend. Right? So that's what makes the session different because they're highly curated and they're curated by people who would almost in some sense doing it for themselves. So they are curated sessions and that makes, this is the lifeblood of the product concave that makes it special. But, but also on the flip side, since there's so much passion and energy involved, we are every year able to attract some really, really marquee speakers, right? So this year uh, we have, you know, if I just describe the opening plenary session for you, that includes Ram Shriram. Uh, all of you know Ram Shriram. He's, the, he's a board member at Google, you know, one of the early investors there, formerly with Jungli and other companies. Uh, you know, he'll be there. Uh, you'll have Naveen Tiwari of InMobi. Uh, you'll have, uh, uh, you'll have uh, Charles Phillips. Charles Phillips used to be the president of Oracle and currently is the CEO of Infor, a very successful uh, uh, <clears throat> enterprise company and he'll share uh, his thoughts about what it takes uh, to be successful in the enterprise space. And and then we have Chamath. You know, Chamath is uh, the former head of products and platforms for Facebook and, uh, and uh, now is uh, <clears throat> a very active uh, Investor, early stage investor. Uh, by the way, he is one of the top ten poker players in the world. I mean, truly uh, outstanding individual. Uh, you know, who has uh, never been to India before. This is the first time, and uh, and uh, you'll be happy to know. Will also announce his first angel investment, <laughs> early stage investment in India. You know, during the conclave. So, so this is just the first plenary. Uh, you know, and I could go on. We have other lots of marquee speakers including Rob Nail of, uh, of Singularity. These are guys, Singularity University, who believe that the cognitive abilities of computers will be higher than that of a human being in 2037. And a whole new paradigm will emerge. Either we'll work for the computers or we'll have to find a different way to get computers to work for us. So he, you know, these set of people are focusing on a whole new class of problems and he'll talk about exponential technologies. So there are lots of market speakers. I would encourage you to go to the productconclave.in page uh, to learn about these. The breakout sessions, which is where the action is, they are all practitioner oriented because as I said, they are by the, by the product entrepreneurs for product entrepreneurs. So that's the, that's the kind of a model that we have. I am sure many of you have heard about it. If you go to this page, you can see previous year's videos um, and and get a sense uh, <clears throat> about what is likely to happen uh, this year as well. So with that, uh, my 40 minutes are up, and I'm going to stop here and uh, so that we have adequate time for question and answers. So with that, uh, <clears throat> let me hand it back to our moderator here. Well, thanks for the insightful presentation, Mr. Sharar. Uh, let's quickly take up the questions now. I have already assigned you a few questions. Please uh, read out them, read them out from your questions pane, and uh, answer them so that our users may listen to your uh, commendable insights. Okay, so there's quite a few questions that are already there. Uh, I'm just reading through the questions and uh,
let me start with uh, you know Devendra's question, and his question is, you know, while selling SaaS, uh, while the initial while selling SaaS, the initial cost is very high, uh, and using the ten dollar idea will take a long time to recover. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, you know the money that is spent in, in building that app is there any better solution to get an ROI? Uh, right. So, so you know what the the we have worked, the, the the question here is, you know, I'm reminded of a very interesting conversation that took place, uh, you know, seven eight years back, uh, and there was a team that had come up with an idea, and uh, this was a physical box that they were going to build, and uh, and this case. <laughs> At that time, uh, there is uh, Dr. Sridhar Mitta who used to head global R&D for Wipro. Uh, you know, this was an idea that happened in his team. He tells the story, uh, which is very interesting. So he asked the team, you know, how much do you think customers will pay for it? And generally speaking, you know, the team which had come up with the idea thought it would be between seventy to hundred dollars. Then he asked the team to go out and find out from their customers you know, potential prospective customers, how much would they pay for it? And much to the shock, they discovered that the answer was less than $10, right? So obviously, if it was hardware, <laughs> this was an idea that was dead on arrival. Why was it dead on arrival? Because in a hardware setting, you know that the hardware, the bill of materials for the hardware alone would have been more than $10. So if you could only sell it for $10, you know, this was no go. This was not going to make money, right? And so therefore that's an idea they decided not to pursue and nobody felt bad about it, right? Because it was clear to them that there wasn't a market, there wasn't a ready market for it. Now in software, very often, you know, we continue to make those mistakes where we build a product for millions of dollars and then discover that, you know what, we can't sell it for, for whatever amount that we thought we could and instead we end up selling it for a much lower amount. So I'm going to mention an example of this. You know, this is actually a positive story, uh, but I'll give you an example of this. There's a, there is a Delhi-based company that got funded, raised, if I remember right, $8 million. They built a SaaS product out. They were selling it for 400 rupees per employee per month. Uh, not making good progress, decided to wind down the company <clears throat> to convert uh, you know the existing pipeline to recover some money to retire the debt gave it away for 400 rupees an employee a year and this was in 2008 time frame 2010 it had turned profitable now sells the same thing at 300 rupees per employee per month now think of it right and if you go and talk to the entrepreneur that entrepreneur says man if somebody had told me rationally, if I was not going out of business, I would have never stumbled into that price point that has made my, my company today profitable, right? So the point is, instead of this happening after the fact, the point that I want to make to you is, before you build, please validate that there is a pain there, please validate that there is what kind of pricing is there, and then go back and do your homework and to decide whether or not this is an idea that is fundable or that's an idea that you can pursue, you know, and you must try out five, six such ideas before you pick the one that makes the most sense. Don't go after the first idea necessarily that strikes your mind. So this is not about bravado and saying, hey, I came up with an idea, no matter what, I'm going to turn it into a valuable business. It's about taking a very disciplined approach and then making it happen. So that's a, I hope that's a satisfactory answer uh, uh, the so with that, uh, you know, should I pick another question, Mohini, or how, how do you want to do this? Uh, is the voice question also, or everything is going to be through, uh, uh, through the written text? Uh, yeah, all the all the questions would be coming to the text interface only. You can you can pick up other questions. All right. So there's a question from Samir, <laughs> Samir Wag. Uh, he says, we have a cloud-based ERP solution, uh, and uh, how do I use product conclave? Uh, you know, what can it do for me? So what's, uh, you know, 
uh, you know, as you look at the whole program for the fraud conclave is up on the web, so I would encourage you to look at this. And when you look at this, you know, one of the things that is not visible on that program is what is not there. So what I think, you know, you have to do in a product company is focus, focus, focus. Focus means deciding what not to do. And in the product conclave, deciding what not to do is a very important part of this. And this year's product conclave, the focus that you will see is really all about go-to-market. See, we, we, we have some focus on design, and uh, and user interface because those are pain points. We have some focus on product management, but essentially the focus is really design, product management, and product marketing positioning. Is you know all our breakout sessions are related to that. We are not doing much of technology because we are finding that there is enough activity in the ecosystem to address the kind of issues that are coming up in technology. You know, there is has geek on one side. There are other events that are taking place, and you know, in a, our success and failure as product companies, we are stumbling increasingly because of our weaknesses on the go-to-market side, rather than our weaknesses on the build the product side. So our conclave is filled with uh, <coughs> sessions uh, related uh, to that, and I would encourage you uh, to go browse through the program. You'll find. Uh, number of useful uh, sessions uh, in, in that space. So that's uh, that's a quick answer to Samir. Let me pick uh, another question, which is from Naveen uh, Naveen Austin Fernandez. And uh, Naveen asks, "Is the ten dollar app really going to work in India? The penetration of smartphones in India is so less compared to other countries. Basic, the market is not ready." How do we handle such situations? <laughs> it's a very good question. And you know, I just want you to remember this ten dollars is a hook for me to get your attention. It is to say that it should not be hundreds of dollars. <laughs> because the new class of opportunity that we are talking about, you know, is is going to open up. You'll be able to sell on the web, you'll be able to sell without the free sales force, without having a sales force in in front of the customer only if you are priced very attractively, right? If you are not, then you need a field sales force, somebody who will be able to handhold and make it happen. Now, uh, yeah, now, since your question is specifically about India, in India, <coughs> selling to businesses on the web is a challenge. Why? Because the businesses have not yet become comfortable buying anything on the web, right? I mean, in the US, they started buying office supplies on the web before they started buying software on the web, right? And that hasn't happened in India, and that's going to take still some time for it to happen. Uh, you know, before that market will open up here in India. So, selling to small businesses on the web is still a very, very big challenge, and uh, and therefore you end up eating something on the field sales force side to be able to convert your <coughs> prospects into actually customers, and and therefore the cost of selling is very high. And therefore, being able to price it aggressively becomes very, very difficult. Having said that, yeah, you know, India is a very price-sensitive market. So, great tip, uh, an example that I gave you earlier, is making headway because it's priced so ad aggressively. Um, <clears throat> but in all of these cases, I would caution you that uh, the market is there, uh, but it's a harder market to develop. And, and some people believe, and I happen to be one of those, that we are where e-commerce was three or four years ago. If you went back to three or four years ago in India and you talked about e-commerce, there were a number of companies, but no one company had broken through. At that time, the question was, is India ready for e-commerce? That was the most often asked question. Today, the question people are asking is, is are Indian small businesses ready for SaaS? And, and some of us believe that that moment where the shift will take place is coming. And uh, that's actually the focus of the session that is called automating SMEs. I would encourage you to attend that session because that's really about saying, <clears throat> is that wave coming? And if so, why? And how? what are the three or four things you must do to prepare yourself to be able to take advantage of that opportunity? So rather than, um, you know, take the thunder out of that session uh, in the next few minutes, I would uh, strongly encourage you to go and attend that session. By the way, all our sessions are videotaped and put up 
for free to anybody to watch. If some of you are not able to attend the session, I would still encourage you uh, <coughs> to go out and consume that content after the sessions are over, a few weeks after the sessions are over. Because our larger agenda, we are, we, this is a pro bono effort, this is a volunteer effort, none of us are going to get richer, we are not doing it for money. Uh, this is completely pro bono, non-profit effort. We are doing this to actually spread wisdom so that uh, uh, you know our ecosystem, our companies can be more successful. So if those of you who are not able to attend, uh, you know, please take advantage of the content all the same. So uh, let me pick another question that has just come in. Uh, you know, I, I, I'll pick up Moish Kachwala. I hope, Moish, I'm saying your name correctly. His question is, people in India have a mentality, if the price is less, then the quality must be low as well. And... Uh, <coughs> You know, uh, uh, and that's a that's a fair point. But at the same time, people are very value conscious. You know, they want to make people. You have to deliver value. So it's not about price alone. It's about being able to offer very attractive value. And the Indian IT services industry did well because they were able to claim because of SCI, they are high quality and low cost. Otherwise, they would have suffered the same trade moish that you're talking about. So when you go and sell a low-cost uh, application, you must make sure that the look and feel, you know, the credentials of the company, the way you present yourself, you know, the way the software presents itself is, and then people try it out, it does not communicate low quality, it communicates high quality. So that's in your hands. I think that's an eminently solvable kind of a problem uh, 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 that, that an entrepreneur can control. Uh, so I'm not so worried on that count per se. Uh, Picking up on Gagan saying we have good techies, uh, uh, he says you said they are good techies but not good in other aspects of the business and how do we nurture such skills? Uh, is there a platform available? Now some of us who are active uh, angel investors, we, you know, <laughs> we have a joke, we sometimes, uh, we have a joke here, <laughs> I'm based in Bangalore and, and uh, you know one of my angel partners uh, is based in Delhi and uh, uh, you know we have a joke that we sometimes are looking for companies that have the tech muscle of Bangalore and the sales hustle of Delhi right and <laughs> uh, uh, and, and, and when you find both of those skills in one company or you know, it may be anywhere uh, most recently uh, <clears throat> I invested in a Bhopal based company Orisnet but it could be anywhere, uh, uh, then you think, then there's a match that can happen. Now the interesting thing here is that in this new world that we're talking about, where we are selling on the web, the kind of sales hustle that you need is, is very, very amenable to anybody uh, who is good, who has good communication skills and is, you know, even, even if that person is geeky, may not have all the, uh, sales savviness that a field sales force sales person would have, uh, you know, that person can be very effective on the web, right? Because what matters on the web is not the traditional sales hustle, but what matters on the web is your ability to step in and help people, educate them, provide guidance, uh, <clears throat> provide some knowledge, uh, you know, and do it in a way that builds up your online reputation. And that kind of hustle that you need is 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 easy to embrace, much easier to embrace uh, than the traditional kind of a sales hustle that has existed. Which is why many of us are so optimistic about this emerging world where where people are able to sell uh, their software on the web itself. Now your question is, is there a place people can <laughs> go and learn how to handle this well? And I think, you know, one of the things that has happened this year in a very big way is the rise of accelerators. Almost in every city, there are accelerators that have come up. Uh, in Chennai, there is a startup center. You know, in Delhi, there is GSF and many others. The Times itself, Times Group has uh, something called the Times Incubator. So, uh, so, so there are many accelerators that are coming in. And what they are doing is they're really pulling people, uh, you know, both entrepreneurs as well as mentors, 
And so if you really want to up your game, uh, I would say that for first time entrepreneurs, the accelerators may be definitely one option uh, to focus on. The second is, you know, you should just start doing something, right? I mean, there's nothing that prevents you from becoming active and having an online identity, uh, you know, responding to comments, being active on blogs, um, you know, uh, answering questions for others. And, and that is a good way for you to start building your muscles uh, in terms of how you can get influence, uh, you know, without... Uh, without control, and that's really what entrepreneurship is all about. So I have probably about a minute or two to go, uh, and uh, maybe I can take uh, maybe maybe one question. Uh, what about uh, this is this is an Anirban Roy? I think Anirban we know each other. Uh, uh, what about shrink wrap uh, products? Do you see any positives about it? Uh, you know, I'll take you to two years ago, not last year, but the year before, <clears throat> and and we had uh, probably one of the one of the most scintillating discussions between two people on stage at in the 2010 uh, conclave, and this was. Uh, Bharat Goenka of Tally and Sridhar Vembu of Zoho. Now here are two individuals who have both been successful by any yardstick, right? Both are passionate believers of uh, the opportunity that exists within the small business area. But they both had very different viewpoints uh, at that point in time. You know, Bharat believed less in SaaS at that time and more in shrink wrap software. And of course, Sridhar was all in uh, for the SaaS model. And the beauty here was that both of these guys are, you know, they think from first principles. And despite their success, had the humility to hear each other's viewpoint. And I would, uh, I don't know whether uh, that video is even available uh, still, um, and uh, it'll be it'll be good to uh, go through that debate. There you get the viewpoint, the richness of this conversation. But I think that issue, some of those topics that were discussed about what's going to happen in the future, they become moot because we've gone past the stage, in my mind at least, uh, if, if we were to set it up again, a similar pairing, uh, I don't think they'll have the same discussion because many of the things that they were worried about, they have, they have ceased to be important and we are in an era where uh, uh, cloud-based and uh, therefore SaaS-based models uh, have become predominant. And I think the current downturn in the Western markets is uh, is aiding uh, the rise of uh, 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 of this SaaS model as well. Much the same way the previous downturn that happened after the dot-com bust was a very big uh, wind behind open source. Till then, many big companies were reluctant to embrace open source. But because of the dot-com uh, bust, and the economic downturn that followed, and <laughs> people uh, became open to new ways of consuming software, and open source benefited. And I think this downturn uh, that we are going through worldwide uh, has made people much more open to the SaaS paradigm. So I personally feel uh, we are at an end of an era for the shrink wrap software and a start of a new era of SaaS software. So with that, uh, you know, I'd like to thank you all uh, for your time and uh, uh, and your patience and for all the questions that you posed, uh, most of which I was not able to get to. Uh, but all the same, uh, thank you for your participation. And with that, back to the moderator. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Sharath, for conducting this webinar. It was indeed a great session. I would also like to thank all our participants for the support in making this webinar a success. The recording of the webinar will be available on tagic.com by tomorrow. Thank you all. Have a great evening.